Computers are all around us, in our pockets, in our cars, in our planes, on our desktops, and even our refrigerators for some reason. Computers are a very big deal, but what is even the purpose of them? We used to be able to travel, communicate, and even create wonderful pieces of art without computers for thousands of years. It's just that we have been doing things really slowly until computers came along. The main innovation of computers is that they can solve many problems much more quickly and are less error prone than a person or a group of people can be. There are so many opportunities for anyone in computer science, such as app development. If you want to make an app, there are many tools available to do that. If you want to make a website, there are a lot of tools to do that. If you want to manage a database, if you want to be a network engineer, if you want to be a security researcher, there's so many different things that you can do in computer science. Based on the large interest of pursuing a computer science degree, there's an important question that we really should be asking, which is, is there something that underpins all of the amazing things that we can do in computer science? Is there a fundamental link between all of these different sub areas of computer science? And in a way, there are actually several but one that most people will willingly accept is theoretical computer science. In this video, we're going to take a shallow but important dive into this area of computer science called theory of computer science and why it has a profound effect on everything that we do. In effect, theoretical computer science is just a way of providing an abstraction of some problem and trying to understand the behavior of what that abstraction is. What even is theory of computer science? Most people, when they hear the word theory or math or proof, run away in sheer terror. And in a way, I can't blame you. We have done a very terrible job, we professors and communicators, in terms of explaining technical aspects to a general audience. And that's what I'm gonna try to rectify here today. This type of reasoning is much different than things that you might be used to. And there isn't really a simple way that is very elegant and explains any possible approach to solving a problem, at least from what I've been able to find. Computer science by its very name is the study of computers. That's what computer science means and how they behave and how to use them to solve particular problems. I would slightly change this to say that it's a study of computation, but this is essentially the same definition. If we put theory on the front to get theoretical computer science, this implies that the study of computation from a theoretical standpoint, but what even is that, right? What does theory actually mean here? There are several right definitions of what theory means, but I would prefer to rename this as a formal treatment of computers. How do we explain things in a formal and precise way? For example, suppose that I wanted to write a program to sort a bunch of names alphabetically. And let's suppose that we have the names here, Ryan, Alice, Ethan, Bonnie, and Mark. And I'm going to say that this list of names, I'm gonna call names. If we're dealing with just these five names and no others, then clearly we can sort these names by hand, as we can do here. We can move the names appropriately around, and it's really easy to do. However, what we want to do is we want to work with something much more general that works for any list of names in any order. And this is known as the sorting problem. And as you might expect, there are many different solutions out there. There are many different kinds of sorts like bubble sort, quick sort. But the point is, is that there are many different solutions to this problem. What do we even want from these algorithms? What we want is you give a list of names and it will sort them appropriately, whether we want them in ascending order, descending order, sorting according to something else, maybe by the length of the name instead of just alphabetically, whatever it is, we wanna be able to sort them no matter what the list is. We wanna provide some kind of guarantee in terms of what the algorithm can actually do. If it fails to sort some list, then we can might as well reject that sorting algorithm. Another important property that is not always achievable, but is nice to have, is that the algorithm is efficient, that it runs quickly, or 
doesn't use a lot of memory or whatever cost measure that we care about, we don't want the algorithm to take too much cost. So where does theory actually fit in here? Not only do we want to prove that the sorting algorithm actually does the correct thing, but also to formally analyze the behavior. Why would we even care about doing that? Because we want to formally guarantee that the algorithm does the right thing. And another thing that we may want to do is, can we actually prove certain things about any sorting algorithm, not just a particular one, but about any sorting algorithm technique? Does every sorting algorithm have to take a certain amount of time, no matter what method that you pick? And it turns out that the answer is yes in a certain sense. How about additional storage? Maybe additionally to the list of names that we have, there's some additional work that we need to store in order to carry out the algorithm effectively. How about the number of moves of the data? Maybe we want to count the number of times that we move one of the things in the list to somewhere else. Maybe we move the first person's name to be the last thing, or we swap two names in the list. We want to maybe count those because maybe memory reads and writes are really, really slow. And of course, we can have many cost measures, such as the amount of time taken as well as the number of swaps that are done, or any combination thereof. As an example, one thing that we can actually prove about every sorting algorithm that uses comparisons, so I want to compare one name against another one in the list, is that each one of the sorting algorithms that are correct must take at least a certain amount of runtime, and that runtime happens to be n times log n, where n is the number of things in the list. It's not important what that is. But the important thing is that we can prove various things about any sorting algorithm. So no matter what you can try, you will always take at least that amount of time. And another important thing that I'm not going to go into detail here about is that these are worst case guarantees so that the algorithm in the absolute worst case, these algorithms are above a certain line in terms of how long that they take. In, in some cases, you can actually do better. So like if you have a list of names that is already sorted, then you can just blast right through it and check immediately that it's already sorted. You don't need to take any more than that amount of time. The beauty of this subject comes from the fact that there is an elegant language describing things formally and precisely. It's an attempt to try to understand connections between various concepts and trying to understand the properties of many different complex ideas and systems. It's important to be able to highlight the need for formalism and precise communication. Because in a world of mis- and disinformation, we need to be crystal clear about what we're trying to communicate. If we leave out even small details, it creates a chance for misunderstanding and mistrust. So here's an example where impreciseness can bite us in the butt. Suppose that we're trying to build a social media app, and obviously many people want to do that. Uh, and I hired contractors to write code for writing the user interface of how various things are laid out on the app. So like, so like how the user interacts with the app, what buttons that they can press, what kind of windows pop up, those kinds of things. We could specify various things like the app has to display the user's picture and a feed of what their friends have also posted. But if we leave the description as is, just write the code for this particular user interface, the person who's writing the code can make any kind of decisions that we want. So you may, as a company, be getting this user interface back that you might not like at all and that now you have to start from scratch because you didn't write things precisely. So we have a fair understanding of why precise writing is necessary, but why is formalism necessary? Why would we want to have some complex mathematical equation or something like that to describe something? Even though I personally practice mathematics and computer science in conjunction, and I do this for a living and I write things like this for a living, I even say that it's unnecessary a lot of the time. So why would formality actually be needed then? There's actually a very simple reason why. Some claims are just not true under different circumstances. So if I want to prove something, it might only be true in one circumstance and not true in a different circumstance. And if ambiguity is left up to the listener, then they may actually believe the claim in the untrue circumstance, but not the true one. So there's gonna be a claim later in this video that we're going to prove about computers that's false if we have a sufficiently simple computer, but 
is true for a very complex computer. So it's very important that we are formal in what we say. And that it's very important that we understand and communicate exactly what we're meaning here. I will mention one example of an important problem that is easy to understand, but is still profoundly intractable to solve. By intractable, I mean no one knows whether or not we can solve this particular problem yet. For those who already know how to write programs, feel free to skip to this time. We want to be able to control computers and have them solve problems for us, obviously and as efficiently as possible. But simply put, what a computer is, is just a bunch of different instructions that I or really anyone else can write into the computer, and then the computer executes those instructions. Each of these instructions is very simple, so like adding two numbers or storing some value somewhere, those kinds of things, really simple things to do. And the goal, of course, in solving any problem is to figure out what instructions to do and in what order to do them. And another goal, of course, that we may want to consider is how many of these instructions we're going to do, what is the total number of instructions that are executed, because we may execute some of them multiple times, how many times we're going to be storing things, lots of different things that we might consider. So here's an example program. And one of the things that is profoundly intractable about this is that look how short this program is. We have no idea whether or not this program is going to stop. And by stop, I mean hitting this line right here, which says that the result is a counterexample. The details of the program aren't supremely important. If you've seen this before, it's something called the collapse problem. It's given a number n upstairs, which starts from one and goes up by one repeatedly we're going to execute some number of things, which is dividing by two if the number's even, or if it's odd, multiplying by three and adding one. And the number n here, whatever it is, is a counterexample. If we start from that number n and we proceed over and over and over, those same instructions until we reach n again. Technically, I should be more precise here and start the loop at four because it turns out that if you start at one and you go up to four, then go back down to two, go back to one, go back up to four. And so there is a cycle of numbers there, but anything larger than four, we don't know whether or not that there is a counterexample. So we have things in here called variables and variables are just placeholders for certain data. So this n variable up here is representing holding a particular number. And this scene here is representing holding a collection of numbers. And it's not important what the collection actually is, but rather that we're just holding a bunch of numbers together. This loop up here, as it's called, this for loop, just adds one to the number n repeatedly. And the while loop in here is just saying, repeat all of the stuff inside of the while loop until the condition right here next to the while loop ends up being false. Namely, in this case, when the number that we're caring about reaches one. So once it reaches one, then we say that number is okay, but we don't, in principle, know how long that's going to take. So we use a while loop because we don't know how long it's gonna take. So I should emphasize, all of this is pseudocode. So it's not actual code that I will put into a computer. You would need something like a programming language, which specifies a certain syntax of how things are written. This is just a way of writing code in order to make it really easy to read by a person. But a person who's actually a coder will translate this into actual computer code using a particular programming language. Why even bother with this other than the readability? is to get away with a lot of the details and just only focus on the high level aspects of the problem. There are a lot of different things that are thrown away here, such as what is this collection and how are things actually stored? There's a famous mathematical conjecture called the collapse conjecture, which effectively says that this program will never stop, namely this line about finding a counterexample will never be encountered. I should say for completeness, this program is not actually totally precise because in principle, it's possible for a number to go off to infinity, just keep increasing over and over. Technically that's not true because it has to dip down every so often, but overall the trend is going to infinity. This program is only checking whether or not there's a cycle of numbers, which it will find if there is one. So if the conjecture is true, namely that there is no cycles, then this program will never stop because 
this line up here for the for loop is saying we will try every possible number from one going up. It really should start at four, but it will never find a counterexample, assuming that the conjecture is true. But of course, at this moment, this particular conjecture, we do not know whether it's true or not. There are many other famous unsolved problems that can be phrased in pseudocode like this. In fact, there are lots of efforts right now to formalize all of these conjectures as mathematical statements that can be checked by a computer. The important thing is, is that they can be written in this pseudocode style, and if a counterexample is found, then the program stops, and if there's no counterexample, then the program runs forever. So one would reasonably ask, is there some kind of program, some mystery program right here, that we can feed in some random program that corresponds, let's say, to a mathematical conjecture, feed it in, and this magical program will just tell us immediately whether or not the program over here will eventually stop without actually having to run it. Because if we run it, and if it's just taking a really long time, we may not know for sure whether it's going to actually stop or not. Is there some magical utility that will automatically check that for us? And one thing that's actually important here is that the collapse conjecture is solvable. We don't know whether it's true or false, but we know that it is solvable. So it's either the case that the conjecture is true or false. We do not know which one of those it is, of course, but it is one of those. The conjecture does not depend on our ability to prove whether the conjecture is true or not. The conjecture is true or false, regardless of our ability. All I'm asking here is that, is there a utility that given any program, not just the collapse one, but any one at all, can be fed in over here and can be checked whether or not it will stop or not. It would obviously be great to know that. Let's call this the halting problem. And the specification is that we want to check whether an arbitrary program is going to stop or not. Let's call the program P. I claim that this problem is not solvable by any computer. It does not depend on your cleverness to solve the problem or not. There's a small asterisk here about what a computer actually means, what a computer program actually means, but most reasonable definitions will be fine with a sufficiently complicated computer program. Let's say, a program for a computer that we use every day. Those are sufficiently fine. This actually goes against what I said earlier about formality and precise writing. If you wanna learn more about this particular problem and how to actually formally and precisely prove this, there are many playlists on the channel for where you can actually look more information about it. One thing that you should all be screaming at your screens now about is, I can claim that this thing is unsolvable, but I need to prove it to you. Anytime that someone says, this thing is true, and you're not 100% sure about it already, you should ask them, prove it to me. And that's what I'm gonna do. So the proof of technique that we'll use is something called proof by contradiction. And it's very, very simple. What we're going to assume is the opposite of what we're trying to prove, and then eventually arrive at some conclusion that we know to not possibly be true. So therefore our assumption could not have possibly been correct. So let's assume that the halting problem is solvable and let's call the machine that solves it H. We have no idea what H does internally, but externally, which is all that really matters to us, is it gets fed a particular program and it will spit out whether that program stops or not. That's all it can do. So let's assume that the halting problem is solvable that this machine actually exists, we're not gonna make any assumption about H other than this fact. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a completely new machine called D. And whatever D does, it accomplishes some tasks, but the important thing is that D exists only if H exists. So then what we'll show is that D cannot exist, and so therefore H couldn't have existed. Because if D could not exist, its construction was made from H. The pseudocode that is written for it, or the code if you want, was written using the code of H. So if D does not exist, then it's impossible for H to have existed because if H existed, 
then we could have made D. So how does D work? So here's the pseudocode for D. The input to it is a single program P. It's not necessarily the same thing that's fed into the description of what H does, but it's just some program here. And it runs the H solver and effectively does the exact opposite of what the H solver says to do. So if the H solver says, yes, this program stops, then the D machine will run forever. And if the H solver says, no, this input program actually never stops, then the D machine will stop. So effectively this D machine is doing the exact opposite operation that the P machine did before. And that's important because the D machine disagrees with whatever program is being fed into it, including itself. So let's see, the D machine solves some problem. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it solves whatever problem it's designed to do. And so therefore, if the H machine actually does solve the problem, the D machine solves whatever problem it's supposed to do, which means that no matter what program is being fed into it, it says or does whatever it's supposed to do on all possible programs. Notice that whatever problem that D solves, it depends on whatever code H has. The important thing also to realize is that D itself is a program. So therefore the D machine must answer the correct thing if D is being fed as source code into itself because D itself is a program. One thing to observe is that D takes an arbitrary program but what we're gonna do now is just analyze what D does on a specific program, which is itself, because it has to answer correctly on every possible input. So if it happens to get the answer wrong on itself being provided to it, then we can claim that D cannot possibly have solved the problem, which is a contradiction. And this is actually fairly easy to see. So let's examine what the two possible behaviors are. Looking at D source code, all it can do effectively is run forever or stop. So let's analyze what D does on itself. Well, if it stops, then that means that the H solver said the exact opposite by D's own source code. And then that means that the H solver says you ran forever. And so therefore D runs forever on its own input, which doesn't make any sense because we assume that D stops on its own source code. <laughs> And we just arrived at the conclusion that D does not stop on its own source code. And a similar contradiction can be found if we analyze when D runs forever on itself. H must say the exact opposite, which means that we get the exact opposite conclusion. I'll admit that this seems a little bit out of left field in that we had to invent a program that seems very tailored to proving that this problem is unsolvable and that it's not really explaining why the problem is unsolvable, just saying, here's a proof of this, which is useful, I'll admit, but it doesn't really help us all that much. Most people don't go writing programs that run forever on purpose, although it does happen. And it's often easy enough if a program is small enough, sufficiently small, to determine whether or not the program will halt. But as we saw with the collapse example, that's fairly small. So it doesn't always work, of course, but it's very often the case that we can just stare at a program and see whether or not it will actually stop. These are all fine assessments and they're all very true, but I have two small rebuttals. The first remains that there's no solver for all programs. So there's no way to prove correctness of all programs because you can't even prove whether programs will stop, much less prove that a program is correct. It's important to be able to provide correctness guarantees for programs whenever possible so that people and organizations can rely upon them. So like the sorting examples we were talking about earlier, if we can provide a correctness guarantee, then any user of that code will immediately be okay in using it because they know that it must provide the correct answer. The second rebuttal is that there are other ways to proving this specific problem to be unsolvable in a more direct way instead of having to invent this other program that will help us in the contradiction example. But these require considerably harder techniques than the ones I'm gonna present here and for a good reason. If you're interested in that kind of thing, one way of proving it is something called the recursion theorem, but I'm not gonna go into that at all. Let's take a small diversion for a sec, which will seem unimportant, but it turns out to be very profound. 
The natural numbers are the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And the real numbers are any number at all, so just like 7 or pi or square root 2 and anything else that you can think of. So I'm going to briefly sketch why there are far, far more real numbers than natural numbers. There are tons of YouTube videos that go into all of the gory details of why there are more real numbers than naturals, but I'm just going to briefly sketch it. The technique is called Cantor's diagonalization argument. And the basic idea is that if there weren't more reals than natural numbers, then that means that zero corresponds to something, one corresponds to something, two corresponds to something, etc. And the diagonalization argument, what it does is it manufactures a new real number that cannot possibly have been on that list before. So it's effectively a proof by contradiction in a similar way to showing that the halting problem is unsolvable, but applied to numbers instead of programs. It's not so important for us to understand what diagonalization actually means or even how it works, but there's an important conclusion that we should draw from this that you may not see but it's important to realize is that programs correspond to the natural numbers and real numbers are the same thing as problems. Every problem corresponds to a real number and every program corresponds to a natural number. And what we just showed or outlined is that there are more, far more real numbers than natural numbers. There are far more problems that exist compared to the number of programs to solve them. Every program can only solve one thing. In fact, several programs can solve the exact same thing. But at the absolute worst, there can only be one thing that each program can solve. And each program can be encoded as a number, and so therefore they correspond to the natural numbers fairly easily. So therefore, the vast, vast, vast majority of problems cannot be solved by any computer at all. I often joke with my students that we could, in principle, write a news headline that says that computer science is useless because literally 0% of all possible problems can be solved by any computer, which seems pretty nuts. Clearly, computers can solve various problems. You're watching this on some kind of computer, but this is somewhat of a mathematical quirk. But the fact remains that as computers get more powerful and can solve things a lot faster and more efficiently and everything else, there's a fundamental limit to what computers can actually do. And that's one of the things that you should take away from theoretical computer science. So how do we even deal with all of these unsolvable problems, right? I actually have four different ideas that you can do, and you can probably think of more than me. But the first one is, let's just give up. Forget about all of this. Forget computers, forget everything. Let's return to uh, agrarian society, forget computers, which is obviously the least good possibility, but it's there. We've survived as a species for many, many, many years without the use of computers. We could clearly do it just fine, but the problem is that that's completely infeasible. The second thing is just to deal with it. There are some programs that are just gonna run forever and let's just deal with it whenever possible. Maybe if a program's just running too long, we just kill the program immediately and maybe we won't get all the results that we want, but we will get something at least. For example, every single printer out there has something called a daemon process, which is a program that runs forever. For example, if you want to print something, the printer has to be on all the time waiting for print jobs to come to it. So it needs some kind of thing that runs forever. Or if you think of a stoplight, it's gotta run in principle forever and there's no real terminating condition of the program. So programs that run forever are just gonna be dealt with and that's totally fine. It's just that we should be aware of them. The third possibility is to rephrase the problem in that maybe we only need to deal with a subset of the program. So one example for the halting problem is maybe every program we will ever see for the thing that we're interested in uses only, let's say, 10 megabytes of data. Well, then it turns out in that case, the halting problem is solvable because there's a fundamental limit to how much the program can actually do. And the fourth idea is to give up on the idea of exact guarantees because there are some things that maybe we can be a little bit imprecise and get things to be solvable again. So one thing undoubtedly is that you use Apple Maps or Google Maps or some mapping service 
and you want to get from point A to point B. For example, if you find one route from A to B that is 1% slower than the absolute fastest way of getting there, then you probably say, that's fine, just give it to me. You don't need the exact guarantee every single time. If you have a route that is one second slower, you're probably not gonna worry about that too much. And the same thing is true of hardcore computer science problems, not just mapping or sorting or anything. If we can deal with some impreciseness in terms of the results that are outputted by our programs, then we can get things to be solvable a lot of the time. This is not to say that unsolvable problems are unimportant, but rather that they needed to be handled with care. One reason, at least I think, is to be able to guarantee something about our proposed solution. If we said to our boss, our solution might work sometimes, you might not have a job for much longer. If you're still around, I humbly thank you for making it this far. Computer science is wonderful because we can abstract a lot of problems into these really simple models and then prove things about them. The world of theoretical computer science is absolutely massive and we are all inviting to anyone who wants to join the party. What do you need to join our world? You only need three things, a writing utensil, some paper, and an open mind. Thank you for watching.